receive the rain of your mercy and your blessing. And Father, these these songs that we sing, these, these words that we sing, just more than just words, they're the expressions of our heart, Father. And while those uh, people all those years ago were welcoming you in as the conquering king, not knowing your true purpose, your true mission, they were really welcoming in their Messiah, the suffering servant, the one who would be the sacrifice for all of us.
in the world right now. But no matter what, we have good news, and that good news has a name, and that name is Jesus Christ. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shame. There is good news for the world who walked away. There is good news for the doubter. The one religion failed, for the good Lord has come to seek and save. Good news. When I say good news, you say gospel. Good news. Gospel. Good news. Jesus is king. Yes, and when I say gospel, you say good news. Good news. We are going through the gospels. The four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. And we're reminding ourselves of the fact that those two English words or phrases mean the same thing. They are coming from the same Greek word. The same Greek word that is translated gospel is also translated as good news. And so when we look in the, the, these, these four books, we're trying to find out the good news. And as we find, uh, as we look at it, we find that the central character of the four books is someone named Jesus. When we look at him, we see that, uh, that he is the one who is proclaiming the good news, and he is the one who is providing the good news. Now, we've watched him since Christmas. We saw his birth. We saw as he was growing in wisdom and stature. We saw as he got ready to enter into his ministry, and before he went into his ministry, he went down into the waters of baptism. When he did that, we learned that there were three different baptisms that we find in the pages of Scripture. Uh, the first one is John's baptism, as he baptized people who wanted to turn away from their sin and turn back to God, repenting, so that they would receive forgiveness of their sins. The second one was Jesus, and the third one is the one that gets offered to us that started on the day of Pentecost so that we would receive not only forgiveness of our sins, but the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus was a, a, a special one because Jesus never sinned. He didn't need to repent. He didn't need to be baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. But he did it, to quote Jesus, to fulfill all righteousness. And when he did that, the heavens opened up, the Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove, and the voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. We saw that Jesus then left that baptism, and uh, before he started his public ministry, he spent 40 days and nights in the wilderness where he was fasting and being tempted by the devil. He won every time. Every temptation that came at him, he, he beat the devil through the word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit that was now upon him. What we said was that we also have the word of God. And for those of us who come home to the Father through the Son, we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same things that gave Jesus the power to win against temptation, against the devil are the same things that are available to us so that we can win against those temptations as well. Well, Jesus went out into his ministry and he started to heal the sick and cast out demons, all kinds of cool stuff that just gathered large crowds of people, and then he would feed them, thousands of people from five loaves and two fishes. What we said, though, is that as he did these miraculous signs, it wasn't just about putting on a show. It wasn't just about having power to uh, even forgive sins. But what we saw was that the power that he was using was to point people to who he was so that when he told them a message, they would know that that message was from God. You see, Jesus was just the kid that grew up in Nazareth next door. To all of these people, he was just another guy like you and me. And so, how would we recognize that he's different than the rest? There wasn't, a, they didn't just flip a switch and now everybody believes in Jesus. This was something that built throughout his ministry. And miraculous signs were used as a part of it. When people would pay attention to him uh, as a result of those miracles, he would also teach them. 
And he taught not just like a teacher of the law, maybe like I would, that would teach from Scripture, but he taught with, with authority, as one who was bringing even more to the table, perhaps like a prophet. Well, that would match, because prophets are supposed to have some sort of miraculous sign or wonder to prove that they are, in fact, a prophet. And so, uh, Jesus, then, was confirming that he was a prophet. But he didn't just stop there, he kept on going down the path. He would do things to confirm that he was the Christ, the Messiah, that everybody was looking for. But he didn't stop there. He also did miraculous signs to prove that he had authority to do things like forgive sin. And when he did that, he was claiming to be the Son of God. And not only that, he was claiming to be the great I Am, God with us, otherwise known as Emmanuel. Jesus, throughout his ministry, built that understanding of him so that when he went to the cross, which is what we're going to be celebrating on Friday, people knew that this wasn't just some guy from Nazareth that was dying for doing something wrong. His death would be different than any other death before or since. His death would have a significance, not just for the people of their day, but for all ages. His death would be a death that is for you and for me. But we're not quite there yet. We're at a point now where people are catching on. They've seen the miracles. They've listened to the teaching. Even he has uh, people who are selected now to be his 72 going out two by two. His 12 who he's designated as apostles. And even within the 12 he's got three that are closest to him. Peter, James, and John who he's building as his core team. And as he is going out, they're starting to catch on to the fact that he's not just a prophet, but he is the Messiah, the Christ, that they've been looking for. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage on the uh, Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to him, Go to the village ahead of you, and once you will find a donkey tied there with her colts by her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, the Lord needs them, and he'll send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Today we get to celebrate that Jesus is king. This prophecy was about a king. Now, in order to understand what this is all about, you really got to kind of understand Jewish history and, and you got to read the whole Old Testament. So what we're going to do is now pause and read through the entire Old Testament. Uh, so it'll be a little bit of a longer service today. No, we're not going to do that. We did go through the Old Testament, though, as a part of our Sunday services, and uh, we did that over the course of about a year and a half. If you're interested in any of those services or walking through the Bible in that way, you can go out to our website, the mypathbook.online, and uh, create an account, and you can, you can have a library available to you of all the church services where we walk through, starting in Genesis 1-1, and walk through the Old Testament. What I'll do here is just give you a quick summary of the salient points for what we're talking about today. You see, uh, the people of Israel were saved from Egypt. They ended up with Moses at Mount Sinai, and then they went into the land that was promised to them through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When they went in, they had a military leader, Joshua. As they settled in, they ended up with uh, kind of settling in, and they would start to do bad, and then they would do good, and they would do bad, and they would do good. And when they would start to do bad, somebody would be raised up as a judge who would not only judge them um, like, like we would go to court today so that they recognize the bad versus the good, but that judge would also be a military leader that would lead them to victory and put off their oppressors. They finally got tired of that, and they said, you know what, we want a king. The neighboring folks have kings, we want a king. God said, you don't need a king, I'm your king. You follow my lead and just do what I say. And they said, well, yeah, but we want a human king like the rest of them. God said, okay, 
that's what you want, that's what I'll give you. So they gave him Saul. God gave uh, a man who was a military leader. He was big, he was tall, he was handsome, he was everything you want a king to be. He could slay his thousands, and they were singing songs about what a great military warrior Saul was. The problem was that Saul didn't right, uh, really was not a man of God. And because of that, it, as, uh, as things went on, he started going downhill. He started to get paranoid, worried about uh, things like these young upstart kids like David who would slay Goliath. And uh, he, he really freaked out by the time he got to the end. But God actually was with David. And David was a man after God's own heart. And so David was actually raised up, anointed by Samuel the prophet as the next king. And when Saul finally passed away, David became king of Israel. David is the one that everybody remembers. That's because David was great in military might. Saul would slay his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. David was a strong leader and united all of Israel, even though they were kind of split when David took over. He pulled them in peace at a time so that they had a strong kingdom. And then David, uh, well, even though he had a weakness, the weakness uh, was named Bathsheba, uh, David ended up through Bathsheba with a son named Solomon. And Solomon became the king after David. That, that really reigned during the, during the heyday uh, when there was great wealth and great splendor and Israel was at the top of its game, at least as earthly kingdoms go. Well, Solomon uh, also fell prey to things like Bathsheba and other issues. And because of that, by the time Solomon died, the kingdom split then into two different kingdoms, a northern and a southern. The northern kingdom didn't do a very good job of walking with God, and they kept going downhill and downhill and downhill until finally the Assyrian Empire was brought in, attacked them, and took them over as a punishment by God. The Assyrians did not win against the southern kingdom, though, because they continued to stay walking together with God. That was the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom where, where really was the heart of David's kingdom and where the kings were reigning who were in the line of David, in the line of Judah. And so that southern kingdom stayed strong for a while, uh, but again, they started to finally stray, and then God sent the Babylonians to come in and take them into captivity and defeat them in battle. From that moment on, Israel never led themselves. From that moment, they went into Babylonian captivity, and we have stories like Daniel and the lion's den. That was Babylonian captivity. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking around inside the fiery furnace. That was Babylonian captivity. Eventually, they got sent back, and they could rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and rebuild the, the temple of Jerusalem, but they were still under Babylonian captivity. The Babylonians were still in charge. And eventually, the Babylonians weren't in charge anymore, but we ended up with people like Alexander the Great and the Greeks who were in charge. And then eventually, the Greeks weren't in charge anymore, but that's just because people in the, uh, like Caesar and the Roman Empire came in, and now the Romans were in charge. In the days of Jesus, they are waiting for a Messiah, a Christ, to save them. God promises through the prophets that they will have a Messiah, a Christ, who will set the captives free. And so what they're expecting is for that this person to come in and be a military leader who will overthrow these Roman oppressors and will, uh, will be once again king of Israel and lead us with Israel having its own kingdom and the Messiah, the Christ, is the King. This is so important for us to understand. Because Jesus, at this point, has been doing miraculous signs and wonders. Jesus has been teaching and preaching. Jesus has been doing all kinds of things. But what Jesus is doing now is claiming to be the Christ. Because he is fulfilling a prophecy. See, your King comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, 
on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah, the Christ, the King. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him. Uh, Those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! See, Son of David. Why? Because it's going to be a king in the line of David. Somebody who is a part of the line of And and Jesus is in the line of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So today, when I say good news, I don't want you to say gospel. I want you to say Jesus is king. So good news. Jesus is king. God, you can do better than that. Good news. Jesus is king. Good news. Jesus is king. Excellent. Don't tell me. Tell somebody else. Get up and greet somebody and tell them Jesus is king. Can you do that right now? Let's start heading back overseas. Come and be fearless. Come to the foot of Calvary. says when Jesus entered Jerusalem the whole city was stirred up and they they asked who is this guy and the crowds answered this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee you see it's a sliding scale you start from him being a guy to being a prophet and now they're acknowledging that he's a prophet and he is claiming to be the Messiah they haven't gotten to son of God and God in the flesh yet I mean, there, there's, there's little pieces where, you know, God opened the clouds and said, this is my son. But they're not really putting the pieces together yet. They're expecting this prophet to be a special one, the Messiah, the Christ. That's as far as they've gotten on the sliding scale. Now, they're looking for a king. And uh, again, we did a whole series on kingdoms. So, uh, I, again, I refer you to the mypathbook.online uh, and creating that account, and you can go out and you can see that whole series on, on kingdom. What I'm going to say today is that um, uh, the, the gospel writer Luke actually talks a lot about this kingdom language, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, and there's far too many references in the book of Luke that for me to be able to even scratch the surface uh, here on Sunday. So I'm not going to try to dive into those. I will say... Uh, If you read through the Gospel of Luke, uh, highlight or underline every time you see king or kingdom. And you'll notice that language coming up a lot. And it'll teach you a lot about what people thought of for the kingdom and what Jesus was teaching about the kingdom. And a lot of times those two things didn't quite match up. Uh, They're looking for the earthly king in this lifetime. uh, And they're looking for the military leader. We see that showing up in the book of Revelation when Jesus returns. But for here, the kind of king that Jesus is going to be is is different than what they expect. Now in Matthew, Matthew talks about uh, this this whole time where uh, uh, Jesus is going in there. 
uh, and, uh, and riding on a donkey on a foal. And so uh, what I want to do is to just pick up a couple of places in, in Matthew's Gospel where he talks about the kingdom language. And uh, as he's talking here and using this kingdom language, <clears throat> um, what we'll find is that uh, Jesus is, is helping us to understand a different perspective on kingdom. Not only that, these passages come after Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the donkey. And so these are things that he teaches to people after they are looking at him as the Messiah, as the king. Here's the first one. Both of them are parables. Jesus spoke again in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepares a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet and tells them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted calf have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. Now the people that he's talking about in this parable are the Israelites. They are God's chosen people, and they are the ones that are being invited into the wedding banquet, if you will. They're being invited to come home to God through the work that Jesus is about to do. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. They've been looking for the Christ, for the Messiah. And so they are invited to the wedding banquet. The problem is that some of the Israelites are not going to accept the invitation. And Jesus speaks about that in the parable. They paid no attention. They went off one into his field, another in, uh, to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but I, those who I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners. Invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people that they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding banquet hall was filled with guests. Of course, what they're talking about now is that the kingdom of heaven is going to be made available to Gentiles, to non-Jewish people. In other words, to, to us, to you and to me, uh, and starting in the days of Jesus. And when they go out, notice the people who are invited are both good and bad. People who are following the law and people who are not following the law. Everyone is invited to the wedding banquet. When the king came to see his guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he said, how did he get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless, and the king said to the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Probably the best description of these wedding clothes comes from the Apostle Paul as he talks about we are clothed in Christ. You see, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We can try to find some other way. It won't be available to us. We can try to sneak in the back door. We'll get kicked right back out. The good news is, is not the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Obviously, that's the bad news. The good news is that all of us, because we weren't perfectly good, all of us deserve to be out there where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what we deserve. And the good news is that we are invited to join the banquet. Not only that, we are offered the wedding clothes. We can clothe ourselves in Christ so that we come to the wedding banquet and we get to stay. We will have everything that we need to be back home with God if we want to be home with God. You see, the decision, I've said this over and over again here, is very simple. If we want to be with God, God wants to be with us. If we don't want to be with God, God will honor our decision. I'll say it again. If we want to be with God, God wants to be with us. If we don't want to be with God, God will honor our decision. 
He will let us stay away. It's the story of the prodigal son all over again. We say, I want to do things my way. We run out. We take our money. We run. We go out. We squander it. We do whatever it is. And we don't want God to be involved in that decision, in those decisions at all. If there is a point where we say, I don't want this anymore. Uh, this was a bad decision. I want to come home. God will provide a way home. And the way that he provides is through Jesus. Many are invited, but few are chosen. The first thing I want you to get is that the king invites us. He invites us all. Everyone is invited to the wedding banquet. And that's what we learn from this parable. The next parable is that uh, uh, the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, and He's going to sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on the right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say, I'm going to pause right there. So he starts out by saying, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he will sit on his throne. And then it says, and then the king will say. In other words, the Son of Man is the king. He's the one sitting on the throne. And that's Jesus. Jesus is telling this parable about himself. And as he tells it, he says, The king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. And I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or need clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of these, the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. And then he's going to say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or need clothes or sick or in prison, and we did not help you? He will reply, truly I, I tell you, Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous uh, to eternal life. The second thing I want you to notice here is that the king will judge us. Jesus is king. All of us are invited to come home. All of us, every one of us, will be judged. Well, that's not fun. <laughs> because we know that we've done things that are good. But when we go before the judge, we also know that there are going to be things that we did not do good. And all of that is going to come out on that day of judgment. You see, this is where Jesus is a different kind of king. And we praise God for it. Because Jesus is going to show them that this first round is not about him being a military king who is going to uh, lead them to victory in battle. That will be coming next. This round, the king has a different job to do. And his job is to lay down his life for all of us. For his servants for his people. Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You have said it is so, Jesus replied. Uh, John unpacks this a little bit further. And he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, Pilate says. 
Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on this side of the truth will listen to me. What we find in Jesus' life is that he claims to be king. And then he shows us that he is a king who is willing to lay down his life for us. He is what we now refer to as the suffering Messiah. The one who fulfills the prophecies that were there all along, but that the Israelites, even the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, wanted to ignore. The, the parts of the scripture that let us know that our Messiah would suffer and die, not for themselves, not because he did anything wrong, but to pay the price for the sins of the world. He would lay down his life for us. This is the king that we celebrate when we give gifts and offerings. This is a king who is willing to lay everything down for us, so we lay things down before him as well. We thank God for what he has given us in our time of offering. And we take the connect cards that we filled out and we fold them up and put them in the offering bag, turning those prayer requests over to God. Take this as an opportunity to take your life and lay it before your king. Let's give our gifts at this time.
our King laid down his life for us. I'd like to introduce all of you to, uh, to Tony, uh, if you don't know Tony Smith. And uh, Tony uh, came to me last week. Uh, this has been kind of a ramp up. He's, there's been a lot of uh, thinking and, and uh, praying. and just, uh, God's clearly been at work um, in, your, in your mind and heart and life. And, uh, and so he came up to me last week, and he, he said, you want to do that again? It was right after we had baptized somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, sure. <laughs> I'm always up for that. Um, so uh, Tony decided that he wanted to give his life to Christ um, in the way that Scripture says. And uh, he said that it's something that he had not, he never really done what it says in Scripture. And so... Um, Today, he comes before us to do that. And so, Scripture tells us that we can confess with our mouth, we should confess with our mouth that, that faith. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that here, Tony, before we go get in the water. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? I do. And are you asking him to be the Lord of your life, to be in charge? Forever. Would you let him know that he's not alone in that? If you believe, just follow, um, repeat after me. I believe. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus, Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. My Lord and my Savior. My Lord and my Savior. You're not alone. Not alone. Okay. Let me go on back and uh, start getting ready. I'll be back to join you in a minute. Our King laid down his life for us. So I don't know if you know much about uh, crucifixion in the days of the first century of, of Rome, but it was their method of execution, kind of like, um, I don't know, if the electric chair or fatal injection uh, would, would be today, okay? But the difference back then is that it was, it was not in a, a closed room with just a few people watching. It was publicized. The crucifixions were done out on a main thoroughfare, a main road, so that everybody who came into town and out of town would see the person crucified. They would be hanging there in front of everybody, and you could watch them as they died. And above their head would be the law that they broke, the thing that they did wrong that deserved death. That way, when you would walk by or ride by, what you would do is you would see the person dying or dead, you would see what it was that they did, and you would learn, very simply, do that, you get this. That's the way it works. Now, as they were trying to figure out if there was a reason to put Jesus to death or not, the Romans tried to let him go free. But the Israelites were not ready for that. They wanted him to die because what he had done, they considered to be blasphemy. Now, in the Roman law, it, it is not punishable by death to claim that you are some Israelite god. That's just not something you put people to death for. Ah, but being a king who's going to lead a revolt against the Roman Empire, now that's something that we can put you to death for. And so, they stripped him, they put a scarlet robe on him, they twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head, they put a staff in his right hand, they knelt in front of him and they mocked him. All hail the king of the Jews, they said. And they spit on him and they took the staff, they struck him on the head again and again the head that had the crown full of thorns. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and they put his own clothes on him and then they led him away to be crucified. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, actually in three different languages, so that all passerbys would understand it. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down off the cross, and then we'll believe in him. 
You see, what we found is that not only will Jesus uh, be king who invites us into the kingdom, the king who will judge us in the end, but he is the king who dies for us, laying down his life for his friends. See, they expected him to lead. And the irony is that he really was leading, and they just didn't recognize it. Because Jesus told us, greater love hath no man than this, to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus told his followers, uh, you call me teacher and Lord, but I call you friend. And when he went to the cross that day, he was going for us, because he calls us friend. That's what we celebrate when we take communion. As we get ready to take communion, the bread will remind us that his body was broken, the cup that his blood was poured out. And as you take it, remember that the one who died for you that day is our king. Let's celebrate that and thank him as we take communion.
started naming off family members. And we started talking about Sue and Robin and, and people that God has put in your life to take care of you and who love you very much. And mm -hmm. You were telling me how much you love them. I do love them very much. With all my heart. <laughs> well, you know what, and, and we all get smart mouths sometimes, and that's why we need Jesus. Because <laughs> sometimes we do stuff we're, we wish we hadn't done, and we say things we wish we hadn't said. And that's what that's what this is. It's, it's God letting us know, you know what, even if you mess up, I still love you, and I still want to be with you. And, and God loves you, and God still wants to be with you. And so that's what we celebrate today. Okay. He provided that through Jesus. And so I'm going to ask you, just so that you know you said it today, do you believe that Jesus provided the way that he's the Christ, the Son of God? Yes, I my And you asked him to be the Lord of your life? Yes, I have. Because of your good confession, I now have the privilege of baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit the forgiveness of your sins, and so that you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, go ahead and your nose with your hand. Hold your nose. Hold your nose. Okay, here we go backwards. Okay. 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 Granddaughter is Robin Renfro. You you might know her from here. A lot of times they serve at Robin's in there right now. Uh, a lot of times they serve at coffee bars, so you might know them from there. Yeah. And and Sue um, that was was baptized. She said, um, I, I think I might have been baptized when I was a kid, when I was really little, but I was too young to remember it. She says we didn't go to church as a family and. That just wasn't something we did. And, uh, and she says, but I remember a preacher, and he was down at the river, and he, was, he would preach and stuff and tell us to come and be baptized. And if I did it, I would have been like four or five years old, but I don't remember if I did or not. <laughs> and I said, well, do you, do you want to go, you know, so that, so that you can have something to remember? And she says, yeah, I want to I wanna, I wanna go be baptized. Mm. So I told her yesterday, I said, this one you'll remember, and, and, uh, and she will. And so it was Isn't an that... exciting day. Today, we get to uh, enjoy that excitement with you, Tony, and uh, I'm just so honored to be able to be a part of it. Uh, because of your good confession, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of your sins, and so you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. We celebrate a king who died for us because even though we're going to be judged in the end, if we want to be with God, the price is paid through Jesus and we can be home again. We're going to celebrate that king on Sunday uh, that is risen from the dead, but let's get a little taste of it now as we get ready to go. Let's see when we've got the scriptures here. We'll bring them up. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God, it says. And so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, well, don't worry about that. Uh, it's not for you to know the dates for the, that, that the Father has set by his own authority. But you, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. 
see on his robe and on his thigh, we know there will be a day where we see him as a victorious leader, king, sitting on the horse, leading people into battle. And it will say, King of kings and Lord of lords. They're going to make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. Let's go from here, being those called, chosen, and faithful followers, celebrating our King.